Today is April 27th, 2022, and my guest is entrepreneur and venture capitalist Mark Andreessen. He's the co-author of Mosaic, the first widely used web browser, co-founder of Netscape, and co-founder and general partner of the Silicon Valley venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, also known as A16Z. He was here on Econ Talk in May of 2014, which was a very, very long time ago, talking about venture capital and the digital future. And uh, at that point, you, a few years earlier, you had written a very provocative piece for the Wall Street Journal where you said software is going to eat the world. Uh, has it? Uh, will it? And uh, explain what you meant by that and to what extent you were right or wrong. Yeah, so that, that, that piece was, yeah, that was in 2011. That had a couple of, um, that had a couple of sort of messages in it. There was an ex explicit message and an, and an implicit message. Um, the implicit message was, if you remember that the, the time 2011 was still during the very dark days of the economic crash after the, after the global financial crisis in 2008. So in 2011, there was an almost like comprehensive, pervasive sense of tech pessimism. Um, and there was a sense that basically tech was over and that this was another 2000 style crash and that, um, you know, these companies were never going to come back and venture capital was dead. Um, Apple at the time was trading at a PE of like six, you know, like, like a, I used to say Apple was trading like a steel mill that was in the process of going out of business, um, as were all the other, you know, kind of really good tech companies. And so there was just this pervasive sense of, of doom and gloom. Um, and so one is I just wanted to put a stake in the ground that actually no tech tech is not tech is not dead tech in fact tech and in fact tech is not going anywhere um, and in fact there there is actually a big tech boom coming which you know which 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 is what happened um, and, and that and that followed by the, the, the that follows the explicit kind of thesis of the piece um, which is um, you know we we have hit critical mass in our era with this sort of very magical technology. Uh, called software, and it's it's a it's a I, I call it a magical technology. It's quite literally like uh, alchemy. I, you know, I compare it to, you know, Isaac Newton spent 20 years trying to figure out, you know, what try to discover, develop the so-called philosopher's stone to be able to transmute, uh, you know, lead into gold, and he you know he never succeeded at that. But now we have this just incredible technology where you can sit at a keyboard, um, you know, you can type in letters and numbers on a keyboard, you can you can press enter, and then things change in the real world. Right, the the real world reorganizes itself according to what what some coder has has typed in with software, and you know there's obvious examples of this that happened. It was happening at that time with services like Lyft and Uber, right? The the coders at Lyft and Uber type in incantations into the keyboard, they press enter, and all of a sudden, you know, a million cars and and, and riders are going are going different places. And there's you know I, there's a, a thousand other examples of this, um, and so you know software. I sort of pointed out in the piece, software is sort of a magical technology for trans in economic terms for transmuting um, uh, labor into capital. Um, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a magical technology for transmuting virtual into physical. Um, it's a magical technology, uh, for, um, you know, for transmuting kind of human creativity into, uh, into action on the real world. And then in fact, you know, a world of basically ubiquitous computers, everybody having a computer in their pocket due to the smartphone, which was, you know, hitting critical mass right around that time meant that basically this, this magical technology was going to sweep across, you know, basically every, every domain of human activity, um, and be, and be, and be transformative, um, and, and I, I would argue that the last decade has confirmed that. And, I, and then I would also uh, add, uh, you know, it's, it's, the process is still just getting started. Yeah, you, know, you know, the obvious things, uh, I think you talked about many of them in that article. Um, information, the media, entertainment. And when I say entertainment, the music revolution that we have that started with um, – the iPod. I almost forgot the name of it. It's so long ago. And yeah. I think the, the early one you could have, could you have a thousand or 400? I can't remember the number of songs. Can't the remember. Market, yeah, the marketing, the, they had two marketing pitches. One marketing pitch was a thousand songs in your pocket. Um, and the other marketing pitch, it was called, the ad campaign was called Rip, Mix, and Burn. Oh yeah, um, which right, which meant you could rip your your music, you could you could pull your music off of the physical compact disc, and you could tra transmute it into uh, a mix. You could transmute it into software, uh, reorganize it in bits, and then and then um, and then burn it onto its at the time a writable CD, um, or you yeah. could or you could upload it onto your onto your onto your iPod. And that, and and you know, I think that that's pretty obvious. Um, although I don't think I like to say on this program that we underappreciate how transformative that is. I. The ability to hear any song, almost any song I've ever wanted to hear at a, not the highest quality, it's true, it, but good enough for me, good enough for my 67-year-old ears. It is, um, it's simply glorious. But that's really just the beginning uh, because the landscape of movies changed like 
crazy <laughs> uh, and still is changing and, and is, is bizarre because software firms are the now the, the center of the movie industry or firms that are driven by software. Um, obviously, newspapers have been transformed. That inform piece of information, books have been transformed. That part of the information landscape. So all these things were have been incredibly revolutionary to the point where you know a teenager today, we talk about things that are horse and buggy for for you and me about what the past was like. But there are other things, and, and then finally, you know, advertising <laughs> through through. Uh, Google, and I would just say conferencing through Zoom because of the pandemic. These are things that just so transformative in so many ways. But there are some things that haven't gotten eaten yet. <laughs> and I want you to think about that. I mean, the two obvious ones are healthcare and education. You wrote about them in the paper, in the essay. What do you think's happened there? And what do you think can still happen, might happen? Yeah, so this is the big critique that I would level against ourselves. Um, the, the big critique I would level against ourselves, which is, you know, Silicon Valley, the tech industry, venture capital, you know, startup founders. The big critique I would level against ourselves is all of the sectors of the economy that you, that you correctly mentioned, are the ones that are being transformed by software, um, they're all small, um, right? If you look at a pie chart of, of, of gross domestic product, they're, they're all small. Um, and then, in fact, what technology does, technology does something very interesting. Technology drives down prices. Uh, right, so technology is deflationary in, in the sectors that, that, it, that it hits, um, and so th those sectors, in, in many cases, you know, there's there's something of an effect where you drop the price, you increase demand, you increase market size. But by and large, what's happening is those sectors are shrinking in size, right? They're, they're, and you know, the music industry has been through this severe kind of deflation effect. Newspapers, you mentioned, like newspaper revenue is way down. So, so there's been this effect where basically revenue in those sectors has shrunk, um, and so those sectors are basically small and shrinking. Um, on the other hand, you have these other sectors, and I, uh, by the way, the, the, just the, the term I use to try to keep you straight is sort of the fast sectors are the small ones that have technology affecting them, you know, very uh, directly and then, and then are shrinking. And I call them the fast sectors because they, their sector is experiencing rapid productivity growth, um, right? And so that, that's the first set. Then you've got these other sectors. You mentioned healthcare, education. I would also add housing. Um, I would also add law. Um, it's sort of law administration bureaucracy. Um, and then I would also add government. Um, and so to, to me, those are like the, the big five that I, I think about a lot. Um, I call those the slow sectors. And the reason those are the slow sectors is, you know, first of all, they're very big, right? They, they are the, the lion's share of GDP, if you look at the pie chart. Um, and then to your point, like they're not being affected by technology to the same extent. In fact, arguably, you know, if you go into the details, probably what you would find is at least some of them are actually experiencing negative productivity growth, right? And, 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 and you can see that by just looking at administrative bloat, right? You, you know, you see this in higher ed, right? The, the number of administrators has like, you know, ballooned out massively in the last 30 years, whereas the number of professors actually hasn't changed very much. Uh, same thing has happened in healthcare, right? Just this, we're sort of drowning in administrative costs. Um, and so this, this so-called slow sector, slow productivity growth, um, slow adoption of new technology, uh, probably negative productivity growth. Um, and then as a consequence of all of that, rising prices, right? Um, and, so, and so all of those sectors have the characteristic, right? Housing prices keep rising, healthcare prices keep rising. Healthcare, right, you, you know well, but healthcare now is like, you know, a fifth of the American economy, right? Um, and still growing, right? And then of course, education. You know, the price of a four-year private college degree in the U.S. is gonna, is gonna reach a million dollars. And it's gonna reach a million dollars in like the time horizon of those of us who, you know, who have young kids. Um, and so it is this tale of two cities. Um, you know, there, there's a long discussion to be had, of course, uh, and there's entire fields of study around basically what's wrong with these slow sectors. And there, you know, there's, there's lots of, you know, aspects of regulatory capture and government entanglement and cartels and monopolies and indirect payment and so forth and so on. But there, there's also just a really big technology factor, which is those sectors are not absorbing technology very fast. Um, one of the big opportunities in my world is to go after those sectors, is to, is to inject new technology into those sectors in the same way that we've injected new technology into media, entertainment, retail, uh, and so forth. Um, you know, optimistically, what I would say is there's an opportunity to basically crack the price curve. Right? There's an opportunity to, to take these sectors and turn them from slow sectors into fast sectors. If we do that, we should be able to crack the price curve, right? We should be able to, you know, over time, you know, tilt the, the price curves in the other direction. You know, which I think would be overwhelmingly a positive thing for you know uh, for for all of us. But 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 boy, there's a lot of work involved in trying to do. Yeah, that. I, part of the challenge, of course, is that those sectors are all very labor intensive right now. The question is, could they become less so through the application of technology? Could we have AI for diagnostics for medicine? Can we have AI for educational uh, training and so on? And there was a lot of enthusiasm in the early days for this. Um, in, in, in education, it's been tempered 
dramatically. There's a lot more sober assessment of that potential. Uh, medicine, I think, is somewhere in between. Uh, I think there is a potential, obviously, to add more technology to medicine, but there are these strong pushback from people who are benefiting from the uh, the current system. But I, I do think um, there, there's so much potential. I'll just mention a quick anecdote. Until recently, to fly out of Israel, I had to get a PCR test. Uh, that meant going to a local gas station where a teenager, uh, my joke is that for, for 80 shekels, about 25 bucks, you could get a test. But if you wanted to pay a little bit more, you could make sure it was always be negative. But I mean, it doesn't seem like a great scientific enterprise. The, the, the kid does put gloves on, but it's pretty casual looking. But anyway, I've, I did the test a couple times when I've gone back to the United States. Since I've been here and you get a, an email from the provider that your, your test is negative and you're excited you get to go on the plane. The other thing you get is an email from your healthcare provider. Oh, we saw you had a COVID test. I'm th and congrats, it's negative. I'm thinking, how did my healthcare, who gave that guy at the gas station permission? And the answer is privacy here in Israel, there isn't any. <laughs> you, you, you give out your social security card literally if you want to pump gas. Now, that's very alarming to an American. Israelis are totally used to it. They don't think twice about it. Uh, it allows a lot more efficiency and record exchange than um, – than we have in America. So that's one small part, but I think it's both mostly rent seeking and protecting existing profits. Yeah, well, there's, there's this, there's this, um, you know, I always point out there's this, there's this amazing kind of thing in antitrust law, um, right? Antitrust cases where uh, basically no matter how a company prices its products, it's in trouble, right? So, um, <laughs> right, uh, uh, high prices sure. are gouging, yeah. right? Uh, low prices are predatory um, yeah. and, and, the, and the same prices are collusion, yeah. right? And, and, all, and all three are illegal. Um, a very similar thing happens actually in these sectors like healthcare you mentioned, which, which basically is, if you think about like, what are people mad about, right? People are mad about, for example, like every reporter, every you know, newspaper journalist in the world is really mad about the collapse of pricing and, and, and you know, in information. Uh, they're, they're really mad about the rapidly falling, uh, you know, basically the, coll the collapse of the, of the pricing of the media industry. Um, you know, they're very angry, angry at tax. So, 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 so there you have a constituency that really hates falling prices and very much wishes the prices would rise. On the other side, on the healthcare side, right, that same, you know, person goes to their doctor and experiences spiraling uh, healthcare prices and is really mad that the prices are rising and very much wishes that something would happen that would crack those price curves and cause those prices to fall. Of course, the doctor is in the exact opposite situation. He, you know, he or she loves the rising healthcare prices, hate, you know, or loves, loves, the, loves the rising healthcare prices and very much would like, like the information to continue to get cheaper. So, so there, there is, this is one of the, this is, this is basically the way that I decode a lot of the sort of anti-tech, you know, kind of sentiment that you, you know, kind of see running around in the last decade, which is, you know, one set of people are really mad at us for the effect that we're having on the, on the, on the fast sectors. And another set of people are really mad at us for the effect that we're not having on the slow sectors. That's uh, a now, great point. I, I happen to know where I think the world should go, but it, it, it will be the case that as this stuff, you know, this is now major league stuff, right? This is, you know, we're not talking just, you know, video games or whatever anymore. Like we're talking about the entire economy. Um, and so kind of these effects and pe people's perceptions of these things and the different, you know, to your point, the different constituencies, the different pressure groups, the different industry groups, their views, you know, the political capture, like all, all that stuff is becoming, you know, very primary. Um, and, and by the way, we see that in our companies. Like we just have more and more companies all the time that are getting embroiled or, or injecting themselves into regulatory and, and political affairs that, you know, would have would have been inconceivable even even 10 years ago. You know, you know, there's this line about academic life that it's so it's so uh, petty because the stakes are so small, which, right. you know, it's kind of a I don't I'm not sure that's true. And it's, I'm not even sure it's it's an insight that's accurate in any dimension. But when you move to healthcare, you're not talking about small anymore. You're talking about enormous. Of course, the potential gains are enormous. Uh, the problem is any one of us doesn't anticipate those gains for ourselves. So there's not really a lobby for those kind of changes. Um, you know, Uber is an interesting example. Uber is illegal in Israel to my um, disappointment. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident it was a lobbying effort by cab drivers. You know, I'm pretty sure that's why it is that way. But in many other countries, that lobbying effort failed because consumers were so eager for the freedom that, that Uber brings. It hasn't happened yet in medicine. Uh, I think we have a reverence for doctors and the medical profession that is uh, misplaced. I, I love doctors. I love, I have many good friends who are doctors, but as a class, uh, they're, they don't understand 
probability uncertainty that well. They have other problems. So I'm, I don't see them as deities or even close. So, But I think a lot of people do, and, and it, it feels good. So that I don't think they, they're comfortable challenging that emotionally. I don't know. I think it's, you know, I think, it, I think you're right. I'd, I'd add to that, you know, it, I, it's like a fear-driven, comfort-driven thing. And, and I like, I, you know, there's a great example, which is, right, surveys, so, you know, polling shows all the time people absolutely hate Congress, right? right. Well, there's 10 Congress, Congress will have like a 10% approval rating. People love their congressmen, right? And yeah. re, incumbent, you know, re-election is like 90%. Yeah. You know, my, my interpretation of, of healthcare is basically people hate the healthcare system, but they love the doctor. Yeah. Um, right. And, and that's, you know, that's an emotional response, right? It's an emotional response on both sides, right? Which yeah. is, you know, you hate the healthcare system because it feels big and scary and, and bureaucratic and like it's, you know, a lot of times out to kill you. Um, you know, you love your doctor because, you know, he or she is the person who's trying to save your life. So, so there's that. The, the macro, you know, kind of the macro observation that I would make is that I think, you know, if you, if you chart, you know, maybe we could put up for your listeners, but, you know, Mark, Mark Perry has this uh, chart. He keeps updated, that, you know, he calls yep. the chart of the century, which, which shows the price curves, right, of these different sectors, right? And it shows the, yeah. you know, sort of famously shows healthcare, education, housing as these spiraling prices, you know, basically straight to the moon in red. And then these falling prices in, these, in the fast sectors in blue. Um, and if you just, you know, if you just chart that out, right, basically what you see is, in, you know, going to the very basis of, of this conversation, what you see basically is, the three markers of what, at least, you know, in the U.S., we call the American dream, which is to say a, you know, sort of a, 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 a viable, reasonable, aspirational middle class lifestyle. Um, uh, you know, the, the three markers have and always have been you own a house, um, you have great medical care and you have great education for your kids. Um, and if, if you have those three things, you achieve the American dream and you are a successful, you know, provider for your family, you are a success, you know, you're able to, you know, you're, you're able to, you know, provide your kids with a, with a better life than you had like that. And that's sort of the, you know, that's the foundational kind of aspect of, 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 of life in a, you know, sort of middle-class, you know, kind of bourgeois, you know, kind of, kind of world and, you know, other, other countries have their own articulation of it, but it's kind of those three things over and over again. Um, and, and, and what we've done collectively, right, is, uh, you know, by having those be the three sectors that have these just incredibly rapidly spiraling upward prices, you know, what, we, what we've done and what we're doing is pricing the American dream and its equivalent in other countries out of the reach of a lot of people. Um, and, and, then, and it's just like basic logic. It's like, okay, what, what would happen if you ran an experiment, you know, on politics and you did that on purpose and you were trying to see what political response you would generate, the response would be populism. Right. And the response, by the way, the response would be left wing populism, right, in the form of people who would want the government to step in, right, uh, and fix this. And then the response would be right wing populism uh, by people who would want to overthrow the existing system and have a different, a, a different approach. And of course, and of course, in our politics, that's exactly what we see. And so, so, so with my economic hat on, it's like, oh, this is, you know, this is just like straight obvious cause and effect. This is, you know, this is societal self harm. Um, you know, we should not do this. Um, uh, I just, you know, I just, yeah. Well, I just have to mention because I, it, it, you can't say it enough, it turns out. You, I love the line you said, and, and these things would get really, really expensive, and there would create a demand for government to get involved and fix it, which, right. which of course, is what it's been doing for about 60 years or so. It's been trying to fix health care, fix education, and fix um, home, home prices. Uh, I, I wish we'd get a little more skeptical about that potential, but at a minimum, let's not pretend, I know you don't, but just for listeners, let's not pretend that those are private market things in total. There's a market factors, they're private in certain dimensions, but government's hand is very heavy. And I, um, whether, you know, I, it could be a coincidence that the three sectors we've been talking about are three of the most, the sectors where government is most involved. It could be a coincidence. It could be reverse causation. They have to be. It has to be involved. But anyway, that's a longer conversation we're not going to have. But your basic point is that I like this. The self harm is not far from the truth. I think. Yeah, and in fact, when you look at, I'll just make one more point on this because we our companies live this every day. When you when you look at how the government tries to help in these three sectors, right? What you see basically is the same pattern in each of the three sectors, and it has two parts. And and the, and the two parts are restriction of supply and, and subsidy to demand. Subsidy demand. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And and right. And the restriction of supply, the restriction of supply takes the form basically of regulatory capture and then monopolies and cartels. Right. Um, and, and in education, just take education as an example. Education is very straightforward on this. K through 12 in the U.S. is, is a government monopoly. Um, and then um, the university system is a cartel. And, and we know the university system in the U.S. is a cartel because, yeah, because access to federal funding for a college or university is, is, is controlled by what's called accreditation. 
um, and accreditation agencies are run by the existing universities, right? Um, and so it's, it's a self-governing, it's a self-governing and, cartel. And, and hospitals, lo and behold, <laughs> hospital, the, hospitals, starting a new hospital thing. in many state requires existing hospitals to say it's a good idea. Of course, professional associations, new doctors, new nurses, right? Like, so one theory of bending the curve on healthcare is there are nurses, there are also nurse practitioners. Maybe we should have a lot more nurse practitioners. The nursing unions go create like, so, so you, yeah, you, so you see this basically, this, this restriction of supply, this sort of government, either directly government-directed restriction of supply or government-enabled and supported. Like, like the, the, the government makes federal student lending available to the accredited colleges and universities and not to the others, even though the, those, those are not government agencies. And even though the accreditation, uh, you know, unit, bureau, bureaucracy itself is not a government agency, it's, it's, it's sort of a de facto extension of the government. So you just see this restriction supply thing over and over again. Um, and, then, and then to your point, the subsidization of demand. Um, you, you have, you know, trillions of dollars of subsidies into, into residential mortgages and house purchases in the last 60 years. You have trillions of dollars into student loan funding and all kinds of other subsidies for universities. And you have many trillions of dollars of subsidies into healthcare through Medicare and all these other, other government systems. And so, of course, and again, it goes back, you know, it's like e micro econ 101, right? Is if you yeah, take, well, a, take a market, you restrict supply, you subsidize demand, you get prices to the moon. And so and then it, you have to, of course, help yeah. people pay for them. If you're a decent hearted person for not noticing that they're related. Yeah. Um, California, California now, California, we're now uh, providing uh, consumer uh, gas, uh, uh, gas subsidies. Um, the California government sent out if you if you <laughs> it's actually a great this is such a great example. So California government sent out $400 gas car because right, gas is getting expensive. Um, uh, I'd say sent up $400 <laughs> per car that you own, right? Um, and so, first of all, like, I, I, it was great for me. Like, I own two cars. I got 800 bucks. Like, and you, uh, you need know, it, Mark, I, I'm sure. I, I really I, need My it. heart like, goes I, out to you. Not the most obvious recipient of government aid, um, uh, and yet I got it. So, you know, congrats, congratulations to me. Um, you know, and then, and then, by the way, my neighbors, right, who own one car or own zero cars because they're, you know, environmentally responsible right. and they bike all the time, you know, they got zero subsidies. Um, and then, of course, the twist is, you know, California does everything it can to prevent new drilling, uh, you know, of, of, of energy, right, uh, the new, new, new oil and gas extraction. Um, and so, and, so once again, it's, once again, it's a case study, restrict, restrict supply, subsidize demand, and be abs absolute every single time, absolutely surprised by the result. Yeah. Right. Like we're like we're like goldfish on, on, on this issue. Like we're, we're stunned every single time prices rise. Um, yeah. And, and so anyway, that is we what look, we're trying to do. And we look to see what caused it. I love that. What's the cause this time? And of course, sometimes there is a there is a cause often, but it's it, it's usually, well, they gotten greedy. They wanted more money, forgetting that some of the cause of the enabling. It. We're always greedy. I always like to make that point. It doesn't really change the amount of greed. Questions of whether it's more enabled or less enabled by supply restrictions that you're talking about. Um, I want to mention Arnold Kling has talked about that phenomenon in previous episodes. We'll, we'll put a link to that episode uh, of Arnold's at, um, in, in the links to this episode with Mark. Um, is there anything, let's shift gears a little bit. Is, is there anything in the last eight years that has surprised you that hasn't happened? I'm going to pick two and to let you talk about you. You have your own list. Um, I like to tease myself on the program. I got really excited about driverless cars because they were just there any day now. Any day it's going to save 35,000 lives in the United States. Um, there's going to be no more traffic jams. You're going to be able to read books while you're on your way to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if it's ever coming. It's certainly the timing certainly misled me. And the second thing would be Bitcoin, which and the blockchain you've made. Your firm has made very large investments in trying to make that a reality. Uh, I would say it is very much an open question. There are people who think it's um, God, and then there are people who say it's a scam, and it's only a matter of time before it all goes to zero. I'm agnostic. I think it could be a game changer for the world. I'm talking about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency now, not the blockchain. They are different, and you'll talk about both. But I'm surprised that it hasn't happened Whatever the outcome is going to be, it, it's still, to me, up in the air. Could you talk about both those and whatever else you think has surprised you? And, if, and let me know if either of those has surprised you. Sure. Yeah, so I'll start by saying, look, I live in the future. So um, the, the, for me, these have both already happened. Um, and the, uh, <laughs> the, the, roll, the, rollout, the rollout is just a, you know, just, a, just a matter of kind of incremental progress from here. So, uh... um, uh, so I, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited about both of these. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, let's see. Take a couple. So driverless cars, we can talk about a lot. Um, you know, driverless cars. Look, it's a it's a big deal, right? Because a lot of the a lot of the art of the driverless car is the edge cases, 
right? And so what, you know, what happens in, you know, what happens in a rainstorm in a construction zone when, you know, there's, you know, police everywhere, like, you know, what do you do? You call um, this, do you so, call this edge cases? Is that the phrase you ed, used? Ed, yeah, sorry, ed, edge cases, right, exactly. Like, you know, human drivers, human drivers are terrible in many ways. Uh, but one of the things that we're good at, right, is when we pull up, you know, the construction site's the classic example, right? You know, the road, the, there's, there's a road and it is there and it's on the map and it's great, but it's under construction. And now you've got, you know, people with various states of, you know, construction workers paying attention or not paying attention, trying to direct traffic. Um, and so, you know, the car needs to be able to process its way through that. And so, so yeah, these are the edge cases. It's, it's like the, you know, the last whatever, it's one of those like Xenos Paradox things, the last 5%, you know, takes the longest or something. Um, and so, you know, there, look, there's a lot of work being happened. A lot of smart people are working on this. The work continues. Um, you know, there are driverless cars in, you know, on the road right now giving rides. You know, there's, there's a couple of companies. Um, including one of ours that have this, you know, they're up and running, and I think it's in Phoenix um, with a with a fully autonomous robo taxi service. There's a rollout. I think Cruise is, or yeah, Cruise, the GM uh, unit is rolling out in San Francisco right now. Um, so they're they're making steady progress, and then and then there's also just the progress Tesla's making, right? Which is not one one of our companies, but the Tesla um, capability keeps getting better and better. Um, and they, you know they kind of show that statistically through the you know through the the the, the, the accident rate continuing to fall, the the per mile accident rate of you know, the way you measure sort of car safety overall is, is, is access per thousand miles. Um, and the, the Tesla driverless system already is, you know, it's quite a bit superior to, to a human driver and, and getting better. So, so I, there, there's lots of progress happening, happening on that front. And I'm, I'm still, we're still very long-term confident on that. Uh, but it, it is, compl- it's one of the hard, you know, it's one of the harder problems. And so it, it, it's taking time. Um, you know, Bitcoin cryptocurrency, I think it's like, I think it's in critical mass and a much more, you know, it's, it's not universal yet and it's not everybody using it, but like the, the numbers, the activity levels are, are, are getting to be quite large. Um, it's, and, and then I get into the details of that a little bit, like the things that are already working. So, uh, Bitcoin as a store of value is already working like, uh, you know, the market cap of Bitcoin, you know, today I haven't checked lately, but you know, the market cap runs, you know, kind of 500 billion to a trillion dollars of sort of embedded value. Um, and so, you know, people are using this and you, there's more and more examples of people using this in, you know, countries all over the world, you know, especially when they're, you know, when their local currencies get into trouble. Um, and then there are, you know, three sort of big use cases of cryptocurrency on top of Bitcoin that are, are, are really starting to, to become real and are starting to see a lot of activity. So just quite quickly, one of those is so-called DeFi distributed finance. Um, and, and, and some of those um, uh, capabilities are starting to get uh, quite large. Um, you know, second is there's this whole wave of what are called NFTs or non-fungible tokens. Uh, unique digital assets, and 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 that that wave also has, has gotten quite large, and there's there's quite a lot going on. Um, and then there's a third category, which is gaming. Uh, the entire video game industry looks like it's going to get upended um, uh, by by this new model, and then by extension, more and more of the media industry. Um, and um, you know, we're we're basically we're you know we're very active in these in these sectors, and, and, and you know, a very large percentage of the very smart people working on games, virtual worlds, metaverse. You know, kind of all these new areas of entertainment and experience. They're, you know, they're 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 using this technology as a uh, as a foundation. And so, they, you know, those are sort of four, you know, sort of I would say, you know, pretty mainstream use cases that are already getting pretty big. And then there's can, and then there's look, there, there's dozens more in the pipeline with a lot of smart people working on this. Could you talk a little bit about? And we had uh, we had a great episode on gaming and how extraordinary it has become. Uh, what role does is what role is does cryptocurrency play in that? And then also in distributed finance, the first and third people have heard of NFT. They have some idea of how it works, but the first and third, I think, are pretty um, alien to most everyday people who aren't in VC land. Can yeah. you give an idea of what those are? Yeah, start with talking about the importance of gaming. So you know, ga- gaming always sounds you know, you know, video games, virtual worlds. You know, it always sounds like it must be one of the more trivial kind of things that's happening because you know, it's like video games are you, you kind of have this like psychological kind of thing for a lot of people where it's kind of you know, it's kind of a lark and maybe not that serious. But it turns out video games are quite important, and and for two reasons. One is, as a consumer medium, video games are bigger than you know the ones the bigger bigger than film, bigger you know, bigger than TV, bigger than music, right? Bigger than news. Um, you know, it's it's, it's a very large industry. Um, and of course, if, you know, if you, if you have kids, like you, you know, you, you see this every day, like, you know, these, these, these things are, these, these experiences are central to people's lives. And then there's this, you know, just enormous amount of very exciting work now going into the so-called development of the so-called metaverse. Um, we, you know, we can talk about that. Um, and so that's sort of a video game environment, you know, writ large, um, you know, with potentially very, very big consequences. So, so, so it actually turns out to be quite an important industry. It's a major, by the way, major U S export industry. Um, and so it's, a uh, it's, a uh, it's on the very vanguard of kind of, you know, kind of U S economic, um, uh, you know, global uh, uh, success. Um, and then the other thing that's always important about the video game industry is it, it's on the technological leading edge. Um, and so it's, it's, it's the place where a lot of new computer technologies get rolled out to consumers for the first time. 
right? And so most people experience video games in an arcade or in a home video game unit before they bought a personal computer. Um, you know, and then there's just you know, many, many examples of this where you, you, you know, laser discs were first, uh, you know, used in video games and, you know, the internet was, you know, video games were, you know, a very early use case of the internet. Um, and so you just, you have all, you know, the iPhone, a huge amount of the adoption of the smartphone early on was for, was for gaming in your pocket. Um, and so it's, it's sort of this vanguard field that tends to, um, to pull a lot of technologies behind it. And then as, as, as these new technologies are proven in gaming, they're then adapted into, into other, uh, you know, in, into other fields. Um, and so, uh, and, and basically, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of a, it's sort of actually a short story, which is basically, you know, video games have always been basically something that you either pay to play, right? You, you buy the game, right? Or you feed the, you know, you feed the quarter into the machine or you, you buy the game for $50 and take it home. Um, you know, or you get advertising, you know, you get advertising, um, you know, you get, you play it and you, and you get, you get ads, which is a lot of what, what's happened now with mobile gaming. Um, you know, there, there's a completely new model, right? Which basically is a video game as its own economy. Uh, right. And so a, a video game in which economic activity in the game is actually real um, and that actually items and artifacts of different kinds in the game are actually real. Um, and you discover, yeah, you discover the magic sword or you've got the magic cloak or you build the castle or you build the house or whatever it is. And it actually has tangible value. And not only does it have tangible value, maybe those things also become portable across games. Right. And so, you know, today you put a huge amount of investment into playing one game and then basically you're done playing that game and your investment basically is worth nothing. You know, in the future, we one of the presumption is, is basically all of that embedded work and value will then be yours to own and transfer into other games. Um, and so this is sort of a, a wave of innovation that is going to transform how the gaming industry works, but it's also going to transform the experience of the gamer um, and, 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 and basically bring a lot more real world economics into play. So we had Josh Williams on the program talking about this. We'll put a link up to that episode. It's a phenomenal episode. But why does it have to be cryptocurrency? Can it just be regular money inside that game for building those assets and yeah. So, it, well, so first of all, regular money. So who's regular money? Um, so the, so <laughs> if you're in the U.S. like that, you know, then it's like, okay, U.S. dollar, U.S. banking system, U.S. Because that know, is regular card. money. Just like English is the only real language. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're, we're yeah. A little, so this, this we're is the thing. Ethnocentric, whatever is it, national centric, whatever the word is. Yeah. Yeah, and then this also goes back to these other use cases like uh, like uh, store value and and, 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 and uh, distributed finance and so forth, which is. You know, it, it's, it is what we're pointing to critics. It's like, look, it's like displacing the U.S. dollar sounds hard, right? Um, the displacing the U.S. Federal Reserve, displacing the U.S. banking system, displacing the U.S. credit card system. Like, these are systems, you know, look, they've got their issues. Like, they did, they did generate the 2008 financial crisis. Like, they, you know, they've got their issues, but, like, they, they work pretty well, right? Um, and, and those of us who live in the U.S., you know, are, are, are blessed to be in a system and where the, the – yeah, well, they don't want to be displaced either. You want to they, they want to keep that in mind, also. We, we, oh, yeah, they, 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 they make they make the medical profession look, look easy going. Displaced. <laughs> However, they, they do work pretty well. Like they do work pretty well. And you know, the euro has its issues. It works pretty well. The yen works pretty. It has its issues. You know, Japan has its financial issues. It, it works pretty well. The Swiss franc works pretty well. You know, we're still, as you know, we're only talking about ten percent or something of the world population when we talk about these systems that work well. Like mo most of the people in the world. Most, you know, it's actually fairly amazing if you think about it. Like paper money was invented 350 years ago, right? Um, it's worth 350 years later. Um, and the number of people in the world who can rely on what we would consider to be sort of a modern stable currency is still, you know, 10%, 20%. Most of the world still doesn't have a stable, rational, reasonable, well-governed currency. Uh, most of the world still doesn't, ha doesn't exist in a well-run banking system. Most of the world does not have, you know, the equivalent of the U.S. Treasury Department. They don't have a, you know, government bureaucracy in charge of the financial system that works well. Um, you know, many, as you know, many places in the world have these, you know, have capital controls. They, you know, these very sharp and arbitrary, you know, restrictions on what people can do with their money. Um, you know, and then they do all kinds of arbitrary things to their citizens all the time. And, you know, it's, it's like, every, you know, you see this, it's like, Every year, like there's some major panic meltdown, you know, it's one year, it's Venezuela, the next year, it's Argentina, the next year, it's Greece, the next year, it's, you know, whatever, Turkey. Um, and we just cycle, you know, globally, we cycle from, you know, sort of financial catastrophe to financial catastrophe. And so, so, so this is a big part of my, like, you know, and you can say, like, you should temper your optimism here, because this stuff is obviously hard to get right. But the other way to look at it is, like, the status quo assumptions have had three and a half centuries. Right. You know, Adam Smith was a long time ago. Right. Like, you know, and the U.S. Federal Reserve is 100 years old. Like, and again, love it or hate it. At least, you know, we know how that system works. And, you know, we now have 100 years of experience. And there's many other countries that ought to be able to have a Federal Reserve caliber central bank after the 100 years of experience in the U.S. And yet they don't. 
Um, and but, so at, at, at some point, we ought to be open to alternatives. Uh, and, and, then, and then citizens, ordinary people, like respond to this very quickly and very enthusiastically because, of course, they, you know, they live with the downside of all these things. And that's, that's where a lot of this adoption is happening. But, but here's what I don't understand. So I don't use – I really don't use cash for anything. I like it. The paper money system you're talking about. I, I like it for giving to people on the street who are hungry. Uh, I like to give them a dollar. Um, other than that, and now they have Venmo. Um, you know, I, uh, the street musician who you also also like to give. I also like to give a dollar sometimes more. Uh, they have their Venmo account there. It's you know, it's actually easier to pay with my phone here in Israel than the United States. But it's pretty easy in the United States. In Israel, everything is is uh, I can pay with, um, with virtual everything with my phone. Um, Aren't we there already? What do we need this Bitcoin complicated mining? What do we need all that for? So don't we have all this yeah. fabulous electronic money already? You are, of course, cherry picking where you live, right? To live in two of the most you know, sophisticated you know, uh, cultures and, and, and systems on the planet, right? So, you know, between the U.S. and Israel. Um, you know, look, if the, if, the entire, if the entire world ran the way U.S. and Israel did, like, you know, maybe. Uh, fair enough. Like, but, you know, but this is like I said, like the rest of the world has... The status quo has had a long time to get things right, right? Uh, and so when the status quo has had hundreds or in some cases thousands of years to get things right, and yet they have like chosen collectively to not get things right, like at some point there should be alternatives. Um, and so that, that's, where, that's where, a lot of my, uh, that's where a lot of my enthusiasm comes from. Um, let me broaden, broaden out the theory as to why this, this whole sector is, is just interesting in general, which is that, that, that this whole sector is interesting in general because I, 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 it's something I really believe that I've written about basically is that this is the other half of the internet. Um, this is the other half of the internet that we basically didn't do up front, that we didn't do, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, well, maybe we should have, but I, you know, I would argue I was there at the time, and we didn't, we didn't have some of these new technologies, so we didn't, we didn't quite know how to do it. But and the, and the way I describe that is, is look, the, the internet was a gigantic advance in networking of data, right? And and, and just and again, going back to our, our example here, it, the internet was not the first network of data. There were many networks of data that existed before the internet, and you could go buy a network of data from IBM, or you could go buy one from you know, from Apple, or you could go, um, you know, France had a consumer, inter France had a consumer online service in the 1970s, predating the internet called Minitel, uh, that uh, the older French people still remember, and it actually worked like really well. And a lot of people in France, when the internet came along, they were like, I don't know why we need this thing, Minitel works fine. Um, and then even in the US, you know, we had these services like America Online and Prodigy and CompuServe that like worked quite well, that people were quite happy with. This internet thing seems weird and different. I have to set up my computer differently. Why would I do this? Um, what the internet did was the, the internet was, was a different, it was a different kind of network. It was a different kind of capability. It was not a centralized controlled system, right? Famously, it was not that and still is not that. Um, what it was is it was decentralized and permissionless, right? And so decentralized meaning it did not rely on any single government uh, to provide, right? Like the French government provided Minitel. The internet was not provided by any single government. And then, um, uh, and then uh, you know, any company could go into the internet business, right? And, and so and, and any, and any, any company could go into the business of connecting people online. Um, and then and that's the decentralized part. And then the permissionless part is really important, which is the, the internet had what's, what's now famously called permissionless innovation. Um, and, and, and this was a huge breakthrough at the time. People forget this. This is a huge breakthrough at the time, which is anybody can build a website. And, and by the way, this is still true today. Anybody can build a website. Anybody can build a website. You and I can build a website this afternoon, have it up and running. Everybody in the world can get access to it. Nobody can stop us. Um, that is not how any of the previous networks worked. Go, go ahead. No, no, I just, I, 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 when you say it's underappreciated, I don't think about it enough. It makes me sad. Right. If you want to build a right. house, if you want to start a business, if you want to do anything else, you've got all these barriers, all these permissions, all these permits. Start a website yesterday. Yeah, it's great. That's right. And if you think about it, even today, right, if I want to, if I want to do a mobile app, I need Apple's permission. Right, I need Apple's permission, I need Google's position to get it in the App Store. But if I if I do a mobile website on mobile Safari on Apple Safari or Google Chrome, on, uh, I can just I can just access they can just people can just access my website. So this this permissionless capability is still there. It's still incredibly important and powerful. It's still a big contrast versus the status quo. Um, but it, but it is it, because and, and then it's the thing that caused the internet to win. Right, it's the, the reason the internet won and the reason nobody remembers all the prior networks anymore other than, other than me. Um, right, um, is because the internet won because the creativity that got unleashed by permissionless innovation meant that you had, you know, a million times the intellectual candle power going into creating all of the use cases, all the great things for people to do. And, you know, those included all of the big internet businesses that we know today and all the things we like to do online. Um, and so, but, but what we had was, so we had a decentralized permissionless um, uh, network um, uh, of data 
um, but without trust, right? They're, 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 and this is sort of, again, the internet's kind of famous for this. There's no trust. Like there's no, like, you know, it's the famous thing on, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, right? The, the famous cartoon, which is like, um, there's no tr sense of trusted identity on the internet. There was no internet native money, right? Um, you know, to this day, if you want to like access money on the internet, you're still plugging in your credit card number and like dealing with all, all that stuff. There's no internet native uh, money the way that there's internet native data. Um, by the way, core internet services like email, like that really ought to have a built-in concept of money. There's still no built-in concept of money. So there's these huge incentive problems, right? So for example, spam, like the reason spam is a perpetual problem with email is because of the economics of spam. It's free to send a billion emails. If you only have a 0.0001% conversion rate on the people that you're trying to trick, right? It's still cost effective to run a spam campaign. If, if we had had micropayments in the internet from the beginning, right? If we, if we had, had internet native money from the beginning, we would have had a system where sending an email would have cost, let's say, a thousandth of a cent, right? So from, from a consumer standpoint, nobody ever would have noticed or cared. You spend a penny or a day or whatever to send all your emails. Um, uh, but it would have killed the spam industry like right out of the gate. We never would have had the spam problem. And, and then rolling, rolling into social networking, like the same thing would have happened. You know, we never would, we never would have had a, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the, the downside things you see on social networking. So, so we didn't have internet native money. We couldn't build economics into the system. Um, and then we, we couldn't build any other applications based on trust, right? So we couldn't have, so we couldn't have internet native transfer of money. We couldn't have internet native store of money. We couldn't have internet native contracts, right? We, internet native lending, <laughs> internet native insurance, internet native title, right? All of these concepts of sort of trusted relationships and economic activity that we take for granted in the real world in all of their various and perfect forms. Like there should be internet native versions of all of those things. And, that, and that's, that's basically what this, this sort of crypto web three revolution is now. In, in my view, is it's sort of, it's kind of sweeping back in 30 years you know, later and basically saying, okay, now we finally have the technologies to be able to basically drop a trusted environment, right? A trusted architecture in place on top of the untrusted aspect of the internet and all of a sudden have a, have a trust environment in which everybody globally can do business and can transact in a way that is like trusted and clear and straightforward. And then again, globally ubiquitous, just like the internet, globally ubiquitous, anybody on planet earth can participate in this. And, and that's why we get excited about this. You're even getting me excited, Mark. It's pretty good. Uh, I've been there excited go. various times. Um, <laughs> there we go. I, I, are we going to stick with this architecture of the web that we have now, which and we'll get to this later probably, but in case we don't, I want to just mention it. You know, I have followers on Twitter. I've got yeah, um, all my tweets I don't have access to them. I can't port them to a Twitter competitor. Um, or is that going to stay the way it is over the next 10, 20, 30 years that, that the, the ownership of information on the internet is going to be driven by the providers of the services rather than some independent way I can port back around either various stuff? Or are going to people find yeah. ways to get around? Yeah, so this is one of the real. This is one of the really big questions that then that, that, that then flows from this, right? Which is, as you know, like basically what what we have. So, right, what happened? Funny story. Um, because anybody could build a website, people build a lot of websites. Some of those websites got really, really big, right? And Twitter, Twitter, Twitter is an example, right, of a website and, a, and an app that got got really large. Um, and then at that point, it took the form of a you know of a company. It's just, you know it's a Delaware C corporation. Um, you know, it has equity. Um, it has a CEO. Um, you know, it, it was public, you know, it is public. It turns out, you know, there's a guy who's, you know, in the process of buying it, um, you know, but he, he's, he's doing an acquisition of a, of, of a C corporation. And as part of that acquisition of that C corporation, he is getting access to, you know, he will, you know, he will own all of the data he'll own, you know, he'll be able to set policies. He'll be able to do all the things that an owner of a, uh, of, of a company does. And then obviously there's this like giant fight, right. Happening around that. Uh, on, you know, what regulations should, you know, services like that be subjected to and different governments have all kinds of programs and things they're trying to do. The EU is, has this, you know, in, the, in their EU fashion, they have this kind of mystery legislation they're, they're working on right now that's going to, you know, be this new set of rules for, for services like Twitter. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, this is because, you know, these, these things have become, you know, just these gigantic, you know, kind of political, you know, political, politicized, uh, politicized topics. Um, this new architecture, what we, call, what we call Web3, which is this kind of new architecture of crypto, blockchain kind of adapted to building these kinds of, you know, these new kinds of decentralized permissionless applications. Um, there is a new generation of entrepreneur um, that, and there, there's a whole bunch of these now, um, that is basically trying to build decentralized permissionless, you know, non-company uh, structured alternatives to all of these systems, uh, to all of these centralized, you know, kind of corporate systems. And so there are a whole bunch of entrepreneurs trying to build, for example, decentralized social networks. 
um, on on the blockchain. Um, and in 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 the new model, um, it it would not necessarily be a company. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be a Delaware C corporation. It wouldn't necessarily have equity. It wouldn't necessarily have a CEO. It wouldn't necessarily have a headquarters. Um, but but it might be you know in in the, in the image of like Bitcoin and Ethereum, what might it be? It might be a network, right? And it might be a decentralized network. Um, it might be a decentralized permissionless network um, that basically exists to coordinate people sending messages back and forth and publishing online. Um, it might be a network that is run, you know, essentially by a community of its users um, who get to vote on policies. Um, it might be a network in which there's real economic value, um, you know, in the form of, you know, digital, digital tokens attached to the activity. Um, you know, it might be a network in which, you know, there you have the ability to fork. If you don't like the policies, you know, one day you can fork it into a new version. You can set different policies. Um, it might be a network that interoperates with other networks. And so you might have multiple of these that actually exchange messages with, with each other. And, and this, this might happen in this new internet native way of structuring economic activity. It's sort of, it's sort of much more kind of, let's just say, like authentic to the basic fundamental assumptions of the internet. Um, and again, the important thing here is we didn't have the technology to let people do this between 1985 and 2009 when the sort of internet first got built. We didn't have blockchain. You know, we we didn't have this sort of concept of distributed consensus. You know, the, the 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 you know these ideas, but now we do. And so now there's there at least in theory there 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 are new ways to build these things. And 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 there's you know, God, God willing, like there, there's now going to be a big competition, right? There's going to be a big competition between the centralized providers, right, who are trying to adapt and react in different ways uh, to all the pressures they're under. And then there's going to be a lot of new efforts that are decentralized. And and you know, hopefully, right, aspirationally, the you know the market the market will decide the outcome. So one of the Things I talk about in here sometimes in my ignorance, and you probably actually understand this, so this would be really good to ask you. Um, I really like Evernote. You have – I like Medium. I have my own flaky set of, of favorite strange things that, that fill my day in certain ways, and I worry that they're going to go out of business. Um, you know, I have a lot of really useful things that I've stored on inter on Evernote. But they're just a, a corporation. They're, they could go bankrupt. They could quit. They could shut down. And I've thought from many of these, couldn't they stay somewhat as they are, not improving constantly, which is what shareholders push for, of course, but merely staying as a useful technology. Now it's got to interface with whatever new version of the browser comes along. So there would be a community of people who care about it, who would be entrusted you know, with keeping it compatible with the latest iPhone, with what, but it could be that's just too too darn hard, and and some companies might find ways to offer me an opportunity to port my old Evernote date into their new app, or maybe I'm just stuck. What do you think is going to happen there? Is is that a, a viable possibility? A sort of public? I mean, I think about Wikipedia. Most economists would have said Wikipedia is not not possible. It's run by volunteers. It's going to be awful. Well, it's not awful. People care about it. It's it's flawed, but everything's flawed. And and similarly, Evernote without a profit incentive, or Google search engine without a profit incentive, or or with a different kind of profit incentive than the ones that are out there, are they going to continue to innovate, or will they just be kind of static? Will this Web 3.0 thing allow this permissionless innovation if there's not? A corporation that's quote merely a network of users. Ex tell me what's going to happen. Yeah, so just practically speaking, so one of the things that happens there is a there is a world of private equity. Uh, there's a world of basically companies and funds that actually buy old internet properties and just continue to run them into perpetuity um, without changing them. And so you, you mean like a AOL email still runs, right? Like Yahoo Mail still runs, right? The, <sighs> you know these these right. Well, and these and if you if you trace the ownership, I think at this point they're both owned by Verizon. The phone company, but you know that's that's honestly pretty arbitrary, and they could get sold to some other private equity firm tomorrow, and you probably would never know. You would never notice, and they'll just continue to run those services, you know, essentially forever, as long as there's a little bit of cash flow they can they can milk out. So, so in practice, private equity fixes some of this. Um, the other thing that you see, though, which is very interesting, because um, you know there is this concern on you know digital obsolescence, right? Old old formats, you know, kind of no longer work, and so forth. There is actually this very kind of thriving internet kind of niche underbelly world of, of so-called emulation, um, right? And so, you know, you're, you're old enough like me. Like, what, what was your first computer? What was the first computer you owned? I had, um, I had the Mac uh, 1984. The Lisa, is it, not Lisa, the, the, I, the well, I don't even know what I call it. I don't remember what it was. An SE? 
No, that was the original, later. The original Macintosh? The original Macintosh. Yeah, I had the original Macintosh. I could write a 12-page document on a floppy disk that I liked it because it wasn't floppy. It was like – it was stiff, not like those IBM things. They seemed like they were going to get broken. But I had this stiff square card, and if I needed to write a 24-page paper, I had to break it into two documents. That was my computer. It was 1985, I think, 84, 85. Oh, so you can go on the internet right now, um, uh, and you can go to Google, and you can type in, you know, Mac 1984 emulator, um, and it would take you to any number of websites. Um, and on those websites, they will have that same Mac that you had back then. They'll have it running in, 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 the, in what's called emulation. Um, they'll have it running in, in the, the exact same software, running the exact same way. You can run that in your web browser today. Um, if you happen to have an old, you know, document, um, whatever, um, you can uh, upload it into that emulator, and it will recognize it and process it the same way your computer would have in 1984. Um, they have Do you emulators the online. Font? I used New York yeah, yeah. in those days. When I see it now, it's a, it's a burst of nostalgia. <laughs> those are those fonts are a big deal. That was a big advance yeah. in those days. That's that's publishing, right? Exactly. Com com compared yeah. to that DOS system that IBM had with the little green text on the black screen, I thought mine yep. was I was living in the Louvre. <laughs> yep, exactly. And so it turns out there's there's a whole basically hobbyist world. Um, and the hobbyist world basically is reconstructing and letting all these systems basically live in sort of this sort of digital heaven, right? And so okay. you can go online and you can play Nintendo video games from 1982. You can play Atari, whatever, you know, console games from 1978. You can run a TRS-80 Model 1, you know, spreadsheet application from 1978 uh, online. You can run a Commodore Amiga, you know, game from 1987. Um, you can run whatever, you know, whatever you want. Like, th th these are all up there. And like, you know, I would say they're, they're at, at various uh, degrees of legality, um, you know, because these are, you know, these are in theory, these, you know, copy, copyrighted software, but like, no, you know, Apple's not making any money selling you a 1984 Macintosh anymore. So in, in, in practice, these he's kind of running this kind of shadow mode. But there, there are these, there are these hobbyist movements. And, it's, you know, so look, it's the same way, you know, <laughs> you're, uh, this might sound, this might sound mean, but I apply it to myself as well. You know, people still ride horses, right? Like, you know, they still like, they still ride horses for fun. They still drive old cars for fun. They still listen to old music, you know, old records for fun. On you know, old restored say, Victor yeah, you can get yeah. a part for a 1984 Honda Civic, in a, you know, easily. And I think yeah. our our friend Kevin Kelly claims that every single tool that's ever been invented can be purchased today, right? Yeah. Even though they're quote yeah. obsolete, you can buy anything. Yeah, and they're yeah, still being right. made. Well, well, he claims they're still being made, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and a lot of them are being handmade, right? Well, so a lot of them are being handmade. Um, right. And, 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 you know, it's not, it's not just nostalgia, right? It's, it's art. Like, you know, what, what happens, what, what happens basically, what happens basically, if you look over time is obsolete technologies become art, right? Like, you know, you know and, and so like, you know, at one point, like the ideal of musical instruments that, you know, that was, a te you know, that the violin was a new technology at one point, you know, many, many, many years later, you know, here we are. And now it's a form of art and, you know, riding horses, same thing. At one point it was very utilitarian. You had to ride a horse. It was the only way to get around faster than walking, and now riding a horse is an art form. And they have, you know, competitions. And it's it's all this big fancy thing, and people get dressed up and have a great time, right? It's like going to the ballet or something. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, these Very old technologies cool. become art. They're, you know, they're they're a core part of our cultural inheritance. And then, you know, it, exactly right. And then, and then, by the way, the internet again, prosaic but important. The internet is the unif is basically the glue that then ties these communities together, right? So everybody interested in reproducing ancient steam engines. Um, or everybody interested in horse riding or anybody inter inter interested in, you know, original person computers, you know, they can find themselves and form hobby communities online. Uh, and, you know, in, in, in practice, that's, that's the way a lot, a lot of these things now work. And, and, pe and people love this stuff. Like, it's, it's fantastic. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, you know it's, it's, it's our assembled cultural heritage. It's the same reason we like old books and plays and music and movies and everything else. Um, and so I, on that front, I, I do think these things will tend to live a lot longer, um, you know, than, than, than people think. You know, one of the stranger things is that in the old days, there were sort of three ways to live longer than your lifespan. You could write a book, you could plant a tree, you could have a child. I mean, I, there might be some more. I mean, you could build a house, I guess, that someone could, you know, maintain. It, it might last for a while. Um, the internet does promise a different kind of immortality potential. I think we've really tapped that yet. I don't, you know, like I have, I, I'm shocked at how precious my photographs are to me and and I, they may not be precious to my children i don't i i don't know if they'll want them but they might want a hundred of them you know i have tens of thousands let let they might want my favorite 500 uh, it's interesting that there must be someone out there right now creating um a heaven for those 
digital memories, right? I assume there are a lot of people out there doing that. Well, not only that, I'll give you, so there's a new, there are new, these new technologies. I, we just talked to a company the other day that has this new technology. Um, if they, they will be able to, your, your descendants, you, you, this, is, this is awfully, pro, I'll start by saying this is awfully profound for, you know, 10 in the morning, California time, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go for it because um, I know it's, you're, you're, getting, you're getting into the profound hour where, where, where you are yeah. um, late at night. So um, look, your descendants 500 years from now are going to be able to listen to your recordings. They're going to be able to listen to this recording and the hundreds of hours of other, you know, thousands of hours of other recordings of you that are still going to be online. Um, and then they're going to be able to synthesize your voice. Right. Oh, yeah. um, and, and, right. And they're going to be able to have you, for example, they can, you know, they can have you and your voice narrate those photographs. Um, right. Um, or, and, and, and so they're going to be able to have these sort of, you're, we're going to have this tangible, you know, this internet memory kind of effect. We're going to have this tangible sense, you know, for the, for the rest of human civilization. I think we're going to have this tangible sense that the, pre- that the past is actually something that can stay with us. You know, there's a lot of controversy around this, right? Because there's this whole oh, you know, yeah. debate. There are various laws in various countries now about the so-called right to forget. Right, it's actually swinging the other way, right? Which is like, right. if you do something wrong in your life, it may never vanish. But to your point, the other side of it is, you know, things that happen online, I actually, I think are quite likely to get preserved forever. Uh, and then look, it, it may be, and again, to not to get too profound, but like it may not be your kids who want the photos, but again, your descendants in 500 years very well might want those very badly, right? And they might want, I mean, imagine if we could do that. Like imagine if we could, stru- we could actually reconstruct in detail what our ancestors were doing 500 years ago. Or, or, you know, what they were doing at the time of the formation of the American Republic or what they were doing during World War One, like that, you know, th- these are powerful ideas. Um, and, and all of a sudden, like that, that's going to be possible in a way that it, it just hasn't been before before the rise of software. Yeah, it's just I, what's fascinating to me. Uh, I've mentioned this before on the program. I, I grew up thinking I would inherit my father's library, which I worshipped. It was so important to me. And as my father got older and as the world changed. It was very sad to me that I had no interest in his books. I'm already, I had to lose a third of my books to move to Israel, and I suspect I'll give away another half. And I've got 250 probably books on my phone right now, and I love reading books on my phone. I love paper, you know, brick and mortar books better, but I love reading on my phone, which is bizarre. Reading books, not articles, books. I enjoy it. And then I figured, well, you know, I'll get my dad's books and then one of my kids, maybe they'll fight over my – none of them want my books, right? Now, with the, my photos might be different, but it might not be. There's sort of a – there's a fascinating surfeit of information here. And it's true I'd like to know something about my answer sort of 500 years ago, but it's kind of like um, the biography of Churchill. Uh, which one is it? Um Darn blanking on it, but the, the the official biography of Churchill. You can find out what he did on a Tuesday in in June of 1943. Well, I don't want to read that book. Actually, I'm going to take the, the different one. So I don't know what that's really. We'll find out. Our culture will evolve to figure that out. There is a book. Have you read the book called No More Champagne? No. The book called No More Champagne, and it, it is literally it's a book. It's entirely it's the it's the history of Churchill's personal finances. <laughs> and it it. it, it, it and it's actually an incredibly entertaining book. Uh, it, actually, it actually takes this documentary evidence. And actually, it's this very entertaining narrative. Um, because like a lot of public figures, like, well, actually, the current UK prime minister has a very similar kind of thing going on. Like his personal life was kind of a shambles. And his personal financial affairs were kind of a shambles. And he was, you know, working in government. But he wasn't getting paid anything. But he was like a British aristocrat. And he had certain lifestyle expectations. Um, and so he was constantly on the verge of running out of money. And his friends were like loaning him money. And like, should they have been loaning him money? And like all, the, all these issues. The, the title comes literally from like, you know, a note that he wrote at one point during the war. It's like, you know, he literally was like broke. He's like, well, I guess there's no more champagne. <laughs> and so, he, you know, even there, you know, maybe, maybe, there's, maybe there are interesting stories to tell. Yeah, it could be. Um, I get the feeling you still like your job. Is that true? How long yeah, I mean, have you been, it, how long you been a venture yeah. capitalist? I mean, that's full time since 2009, so thir- 13 years. It's a long time. And, yeah. But is it boring? Is there anything boring about it? Yeah. No, no, no. Um, so the, 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 the big thing is it's endlessly stimulating. We, this is kind of the great, the great kind of good fortune of being in the job is we, we get thousands of the smartest people in the world walking in the door every year. And they just tell us everything, right? And and these are, you know, legitimately the smartest, you know, highly, you know, highest IQ, highest educated, most trained, most specialized experts in every conceivable field you can imagine. And then they also happen to, of course, if they're talking to us, they have entrepreneurial personalities. And so that, you know, they want to do new things in the world and they have ideas. Um, and then, you know, it's literally, and it's, it's across all these domains. Like it's no longer just, you know, computer stuff or video game stuff or whatever. It's now, you know, it's a lot of the conversations are about these, these issues we talked about today, healthcare and education and the future of society and, 
and all these and all you know pol- your politics and all all these things because you know technology now cuts into uh, into all these fields. And so we get the we get the uh, we, we you know we get to, we get to learn from them. We get you know we get to help them um, you know in in their lives and their careers. We get to help them build companies and products. We get to see you know <laughs> a lot of them don't work, but some of them become very important. Um, and then the other is, is it's just hard you know it's hard to be a pessimist in the job because it's it's just like you know, you never know when the ne- literally, literally the next big thing is about to walk in the door. And then that just gives you this sense of like, things are possible, right? The, the, you know, the, the, the world can become a better place and quite quickly, um, it, you know, in unpredictable ways, but you know, with a pretty high degree of certainty that things are going to get better. Um, and, and again, that just, that flows from the competence and caliber of the people. And, and, and by the way, people from all over the world, right? The, the, you know, this entire industry is globalizing at a ferocious pace. Um, and so we're talking to incredibly bright people from all over the world. A lot of it's now happening online. Right. Um, a lot of it's now virtual, like we're, we're spreading out globally in a way that we, we weren't even before COVID. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's, it's hard not to be excited. Is there a project you funded that you're most proud of? Uh, or three? Which, yeah. Which, or is that which, too which personal? Are, what's your favorite? Yeah. What's your favorite yeah, child? Kid, um, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, look, I, I don't, I'll, I'll just give you a general theme. Like it, it, for a very long, like I grew up in the rural Midwest and I mean, in the very rural Midwest, like the nearest bookstore to where I grew up was an hour away. Right. And, 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 you know, that was an 800 square foot bookstore. <laughs> so this is not, you know, this is not, you know, um, uh, now we should describe it as a culturally rich environment. Um, you know, for a very long time, uh, you know, to kind of have access to culture and information and intellectual activity um, and, and, and then economic opportunity. Um, you know, you, you needed to be in a big city or you needed to be in a college town. Um, and that was certainly the case, you know, still when I was growing up, um, you know, the internet kind of fixed the intellectual kind of aspect of that, you know, probably 15 or 20 years ago to your point, uh, you know, when every book and every piece of music and so forth became available, um, you know, now you can have a very different experience in a rural environment than you did when, when I was a kid. Um, you know, a big thing happening right now, this whole post COVID world, like this whole remote distributed work thing is happening. Um, and so I, I think we're actually at a sort of civilizational turning point um, in, in many ways where, uh, you know, the, this historical pattern of, you know, this historical archetypal pattern um, of the ambitious kid needs to leave the countryside to go to the city to have Makes access sense. to good jobs um, and, and a good life. Like that's been the case for thousands of years. And I think that might have just changed. Um, and it's not, and look, it's not that all the kids are going to want to stay in a rural environment, but it's uh, all of a sudden it, it, you know, regardless of where you are, you're going to have access to top flight economic opportunity. Uh, you're going to have access to jobs that are going to fully, you know, take advantage of your skills and expertise, and you're going to get paid accordingly. Um, and so I think people are going, people already are starting to be able to make fundamentally different decisions about how they choose to live. Um, right. And that's all aspects of life, including families and every other kind of aspect of how you choose to live. Um, and they're able to do that without trading off economic opportunity. Um, and I, I think that might, I think that might be the single biggest thing happening right now. And, and of course, our, our companies, I, I answer that, that, that question that way, because of course, our companies are, are sent, you know, this, this all now rests on technology, right? This all rests on technologies like the ones we're using right now. Um, and so, our, our, you know, we have a lot of companies that have all kinds of, you know, remote work, collaboration, communication, coordination, you know, all, all these systems that are required to make what I, what I just described happen. Um, and then to, uh, you know, to kind of help this new world function. And so that, that's probably the single, probably the single biggest thing happening right now. So I don't think I've been in the same room with you. I don't know if I shook your hand. We've done this twice. Um, the, the interview, the first time wasn't on zoom. It was just over, you know, it was like a phone call, the equivalent of a phone call. And, um, it's pretty fabulous that I get to talk to you. Um, you know, I, I don't just, it's not just nice. I cherish it um, that I get to talk to really provocative and extraordinary people. It's a miracle. It's really a miracle. And I get to look into your eyes. I get to smile. You get to smile. You know, it, it, it's very special. But there's also some, that there's something missing. And and I'm, I'm curious what you think um, – the role will be left for the tactile, the 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 brick and mortar, three D, four D encounter, rather than this. It's a great one, but it's pretty flat. You know, it's flat. <laughs> so I think of it as a bar. It's, I think of it as a spectrum, and I, 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 I use the metaphor of the barbell for where I think it's going. So the way I would describe it is. You hear a lot about this for like remote work. It's like, well, remote work isn't going to be the same as being in the office, right? But then you ask yourself, okay, like, was being in the office really that good to start with, right? Like, right? <laughs> Definitely overrated. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, and, and you think like, hey, wait, what was the office? Like, why do offices exist? So one of the fun things, I've been reading a lot of history for the last few years, you know, trying to figure out what, what's happening in our world, but reading a lot of history. And one of the things you learn is like, the Roman Empire, like the Roman Empire, there were no offices. Like they didn't, there was no office of the Roman Empire. Like they, there was no office building. They didn't go to work. Like they ran the world uh, and, they, and they, they, they did it from their homes and they did it by walking around the street and they, they yeah. did it by traveling and they did it in the Senate, but there was no office. Right. And so forth and so on. And by the way, the same thing with like creation, of, you know, creation of the United States, like, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the founding fathers didn't work out of an office. Like most of the great things in history didn't happen in office. And so, what, you know, where did the office come from? The office came basically from the factory. Right. And it's it sort of, and they're, they're, you know, therefore, you know, this whole thing of like, well, we have, you know, how does the office life organized? It's like, you know, we have half hour, hour long meetings, right, on a calendar and they start at eight or eight thirty or nine. Right. And it's, you know, just like a factory, just like a school. Right. So school, same thing. You know, this, this whole idea, you know, <laughs> Alexander the Great was not taught, um, you know, in a school. Right. He was taught by, you know, Aristotle, right, a guy in, in, at home. You know, so, so this whole idea, right, that you, that you have these offices, schools, factories, whatever, these are modern constructs. Um, and then, yeah, the, the experience, and by the way, the college campus, same thing, right? Like, the college campus is older than that, you know, whatever, 500 years old or whatever. But, like, it's the same thing. It's like, I, I, don't, know if you, I don't know if you experienced this. You, you probably have. You, you, pro- you know, when you were on the Stanford campus, you know, there were probably a lot of people who, in theory, you were going to go talk to on the Stanford campus at, at, at some point. And... Right. And maybe, you'd, you know, you'd run into them at the faculty club and say hi. And, you know, how about, the, you know, it's, it's the old water cooler conversation thing. It's like, well, how about, you know, talk about the water cooler. It's like, how about that TV show we both watched? How about that sports game we both watched? Like, it's not, a lot of those are not real, real conversations. And so I guess what I was, I go through that to say, like, that was like an optimized, it was sort of an optimized approach of, of sort of this co-location, this sort of fake co-location thing in the form of an office or a campus was sort of imposed by the technology of, 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 of the era. But now we have two other kinds of technologies that I think are much better. So one is we have the technology we're using today. We have on the other, you know one side of the barbell, which is sort of constant, call it constant inter- intermittent digital contact, right? So you know you can talk to me anytime you want because you can text me, you can message me, like you can tweet at me, like I, I'm always there. We can always interact. We can always jump on Zoom. It's it's very easy. On the other side, we have long distance travel, right? We have the ability to actually go see somebody in person, and then. The fact that I don't, this is what we're finding in the workplace, is the fact that I don't have to be in the office every day for eight hours means that I can actually travel a lot more, right? And I can actually work from the road, right? I can actually do all my other work from the road because I'm now, you know, completely portable for all the other work that I do. Um, and so I, I think the answer to your question, which I think is very good, basically, is we should basically gap out to both sides of the barbell. We should have a lot more intermittent digital communication and be in touch with a lot more people all the time than we ever could be in an office or on a campus, um, and then we should also be, we should also be in the real world a lot more. We should be on the road a lot more. Um, we should be, you know, traveling around and doing all kinds of things and, you know, going on adventures and being lots of places and visiting friends and family more often. And, and I, and I, and I, and I think those are, I think those are actually very nicely complimentary. And I, and I think the combination of those two approaches at the ends of the barbell, I think it's a better way to live. Um, and, and I suspect it's where things are going. And we did an episode with Megan McArdle based on, uh, Roger Scruton's book, Where You Are, and that story which appeals deeply to me because I'm uh, – I forget which kind I am. It's – it's uh, there, there's a, a dichotomy there. But you and I are both the people who are happy traveling around. And there's a whole group of people who like to grow up somewhere and stay. Um, and we're leavers. Uh, we went – you left the rural Midwest. I left the south and then suburban Massachusetts. And I've been all over the world, taught in a bunch of schools. And I wouldn't have had it any other way. But not everybody feels that way. There's there's a strong human impulse toward home, and and home is a physical place. And for you and me, home is our Twitter account, which has got to be one of the weirdest things of all time in human civilization history. Uh, does that mean you have to leave that that noise? I do, I do. Unfortunately, yes. But yes. Okay. Sh- should we? Um, can we close and talk for two seconds about uh, Elon Musk? Oh, so let's do the, let's do quick, it's hard to do the quick version, but let's try the, the quick version. Yeah. Tell me, so we're almost out of time. Uh, tell me um, what you think about this this brouhaha over to use a very um, brick and mortar world over uh, a very rich man buying a very important information source called Twitter, and then making different rules than the rules they're making, and maybe rules that are different than the government's rules. And what are your thoughts on that? You've been writing a lot of interesting things on on Twitter about it. Yeah, well, I will start. I will start by saying something. I know this will shock you. Um, this is not the first rich man in history to buy a, a critical information source. 
in, in, in fact, there is a rather long history <laughs> of of this kind of thing happening. And in fact, you know, virtually every information source we have today, you know, there's a very rich person at the at the at the head of it who either owns it or controls it. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, starting with the Salzburgers and working your way through through, through the hierarchy. So. Uh, you know, so on the one hand, there's a bit of a crocodile tears thing, you know, happening where people are, you know, or I guess a Casablanca thing where people are shocked by the gambling is happening in the casino. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, rich, rich people are going to are going to buy things. Um, yeah. These things. Um, you know, there is that. Obviously, that's not what people are upset about. People are upset about the fact that he is pro free speech. Um, and we live in this just like, to me, completely bizarre moment. Um, where, you know, the great and the good among us have decided that free speech is not good, but bad. Um, and that somebody who is, you know, staunchly pro free speech is therefore bad. Um, and it's this, you know, in my view, it's this extraordinary ethical and moral regression, you know, that's kind of happened over the last 10 years. And it's been almost, you know, completely not talked about because the people who talk about such things are, are in on it. You know, they're, they're a part of it. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, Nobody, nobody's advocating for speech restrictions more than journalists, which is just a completely bizarre turn of events. Yeah. Um, and so here you have a guy, uh, you know, he and I happen to be, you know, we're both, I think we're both 50. We happen to be the exact same age. Um, you know, I, you know, <laughs> I won't speak for him. I'll just say like, it was completely normal for kind of, you know, well-intentioned liberals of, you know, our generation to just consider, you know, to have the classic ACLU on, view on free speech, which is free speech is good. And it's encoded into the constitution for a reason. And it's deeply entrenched in our culture for a reason. And it's, you know, incredibly valuable. And that basically all social progress of all of recorded history has come from people being able to express themselves. And that these are very hard won, you know, both legal and cultural rights uh, that we have. Um, and so I, you know, to me, it's just, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to have a guy, you know, like that step up and say, look, I not only believe this, but I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and do something about it. Um, so I, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know anything about, you know, I don't know anything beyond what, what he said publicly, but in public, you know, he's been very strong on this so far. And I, you know, I, I think it's great. So you think it's going to be more than we're just, we're getting an edit button. I think, yes, he is going to, yes. Well, this is, this is the Elon. So the good news with Elon is he, he, you now have a lot of game film, uh, as we call it in our world. Uh, you have a lot of game film. Like, you know, people have, you know, like a Tesla, like Tesla's the, you know, it's, looks the most valuable car company on the planet, builds the best car. It, like, it's amazing. You know, SpaceX is completely revolutionizing, you know, all aspects of, of space, aerospace. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're doing just absolutely extraordinary things. These, I mean, who, <laughs> who knew you could land a rocket on its butt? Right. Like that, well, I don't know about you, but that, that, that took me by, that legit took me by surprise. Like I would not have assumed that you could like, you know, land, I mean, maybe a parachute, like, you know, maybe whatever, but like, no, you can actually guide the rocket down like that and land it on its rear end. And it like stays upright. Like that's amazing. Right. And so his, you know, I look, you know, he'll, he'll do what he does, but like, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to, be, it's hard to believe that his impact will be minor. Um, uh, I, I guess I put it that way. My guest today has been Mark Andreessen. Mark, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Good. Thank, thanks, Russ. An honor. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.